Yo, what's up everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and I practice the real, 100% traditional Japanese karate. Everything I do is traditional. I practice the traditional techniques. I wear the traditional uniform, and I definitely say all of the most traditional Japanese phrases. Look at my hajimaki! It says muteki! That means I'm invincible! Us! Have you ever met someone who talks like that in real life? I'm betting that if you've spent more than five minutes in online martial arts spaces like on Reddit or on a Discord server, then you've probably seen that guy around. And once you've met that guy, you'll probably find someone just like this. Traditional martial arts are all crap. They never spar, they don't pressure test their techniques, and they're always practicing those fancy looking useless katas. Ew. Their stuff wouldn't work in the cage, unlike my gym style, where we practice Muay Thai and BJJ. Nothing traditional about those arts, just cold hard facts and iron fists. Us! You see, uh, the, the modern martial arts guy says us too, because, you know, BJJ, right? We get it? Yeah, we get it. All right, good. This is one of the most classic debates that ever happens between martial artists. The debate between Traditional martial arts versus modern martial arts. Almost all of the greats of martial arts YouTube have their own take on it. Sensei Seth's got a video about it. Rokas from Martial Arts Journey has a video about it. Ramsey Dewey has a great video about it. And Art of One Dojo has two whole separate videos, both of which are really great, just covering this topic. The debate between traditional martial arts and modern martial arts must have run into a dim mock practitioner somewhere, because it's been done to death. So if there are so many videos out there covering what a traditional martial art is, and what it isn't, and whether it's better or worse than a modern martial art, then what am I doing here making one of my own, you might ask, hypothetically, in the situation I'm constructing in my mind? Good question, hypothetical asker that I just made up, who somehow seems to know exactly what I want to talk about. Well, first off, Covering the distinction between traditional and modern martial arts is somewhat of a rite of passage here in martial arts YouTube. I hit a thousand subscribers a few months back, but you know, I don't think that I'll ever really feel like a true martial arts YouTuber until I cover this topic for myself. But more than that, I wanted to cover this topic because every single person who's made a video about this so far is completely wrong. Or well, they're not really wrong per se. In fact, I like most of their videos quite a bit, but because I think that I have something unique that I can bring to this discussion, you know, from a philosopher's perspective. Because that's what I am, I'm a philosopher. Citation needed. So, without further ado, let's dip our toes really briefly back into the cesspool of online opinions and see if we can't figure out what a traditional martial art really is, whether they are inherently worse than modern martial arts or not, and find the answer to the most important question, how many times I can say us in this video without my anti-us friends canceling me for it? Let's us into it. Alright, so let's start by clearing away some definitions of what a traditional martial art is that are just pretty clearly wrong. Ramsey Dewey has correctly pointed out that the actual age of a martial art, or how long it's been practiced, has very little to do with whether it gets considered traditional or not. Wrestling a sport so old that we don't actually know Plato's real name because the name Plato was just his wrestling nickname, kind of like if in about 4,000 years one of our philosophers was known as The Rock, is generally not lumped in with traditional martial arts, despite having one of the longest standing traditions there is. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is about as old as Judo, and in fact Judo wasn't even being called Judo when Maeda Mitsuyo brought it to the Gracie family, but both of those arts are much older than Taekwondo is. And yet, generally speaking, we think of Taekwondo as being the more traditional of those arts. Even Muay Thai, or rather Muay Boren, as we call the style as it existed before the standardization of its competitive rule set, has been around since at least the 17th century, but it generally isn't considered as traditional as Kyokushin Karate, which wasn't even founded until 1964. So it's not just a matter of out with the old, in with the new. Alright, well, another common definition of traditional martial art 
is that it's a martial art that seeks to recreate and preserve the knowledge and training methods of the past. You know, like a tradition. A martial art that was passed down the Armstrong family line for generations, if you will. I'm not actually as buff as Alex Louis Armstrong. I'm gonna put up a photo of him. It's gonna be very funny. You're just gonna have to trust me. But as Mr. Dan over at Art of One Dojo points out, by that definition, all arts, except for maybe the kind of fake ninjutsu that weebs make up in their backyards, will count as some sort of traditional martial art. Boxers study the strategies and techniques of the greats. Nakamui have not only maintained their historical techniques, but even a lot of the rituals that go along with their practice, and BJJ practitioners are basically just preserving the newaza that got modernized out of judo's curriculum. Supplemented with a little stuff from Brazilian catch wrestling, please don't call me out for a historical error, I, I know it's more complicated than that. All of these arts accept new techniques and training methods, but then again, so do almost all of the so-called traditional styles. Karate stole judo's uniforms and a few of their techniques, Taekwondo learned how to make rebreakable plastic boards, and Chilala has managed to make Wing Chun work in the ring. Besides, where do you think all of these modern martial arts get most of their new techniques from? Mostly it comes from contact with other, more traditional styles. Alright, like DJ Khaled would say, another one. This time, let's take a look at what martial arts usually get called traditional, which ones usually get called modern, and see if we can't figure out what the definition is by comparing them and seeing what they've got in common. So for traditional martial arts, we'll usually hear karate, taekwondo, kenpo, Japanese jiu-jitsu usually gets in there, kung fu, aikido, tangsudo, tai chi, maybe a few others. And on the modern side, we generally see arts such as boxing, BJJ, kickboxing, Muay Thai, judo sometimes, Krav Maga, wrestling, both Greco-Roman or freestyle, sometimes even catch, and maybe a few others. Oh, and also Lethway, because they have headbutts, which makes them modern somehow. One thing stands out to me about this list, the traditional martial arts almost all seem to come from China, Japan, or Korea, maybe other places in East Asia. And on the other hand, most of the modern martial arts seem to either come from the West or were turned into their more modern form by the West, with maybe the exceptions of Muay Thai and Judo. So then, traditional martial arts just means arts that come from East Asia, right? Well, plenty of people do use the term that way, but no, I don't think that's a good definition either. For one thing, Judo is Japanese, but that's considered one of the modern ones, at least by most people. And while some people will generally say that most karate counts as traditional, they are sometimes willing to lump in a few offshoots like Kudo or some of the Kempo styles as being more modern. And most American Kempo is, well, American, even if it does have some roots in Okinawan or Chinese martial arts, and most American Kempo styles have undergone just as much modernization and localization as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but generally they still get lumped into the traditional category. You could also say that modern means that it's an effective art, but in that case, you might as well just say effective arts and bullshit arts. Rokas Leo said it best when he pointed out that there is actually a big difference between traditional martial arts and fantasy-based martial arts. After all, you do see plenty of arts that generally get called traditional being incredibly successful and effective in the octagon, even against other much more modern styles. And it's also not whether or not they have kata or forms, because not only have many styles of karate and its offshoots completely done away with practicing kata, and certain traditional styles like Aikido never really had them much in the first place outside of their weapons work, but also judo has kata, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been developing forms that look almost exactly like their kata, and Muay Thai even has some ritual dances that are basically, I'm gonna say it, the same thing as kata. All right, well, so then there's no definition of a traditional martial art, right? Well, while it might be tempting to say that, there are clearly some arts that are much more or less close to what we mean when we say traditional. Aikido is more traditional than BJJ. Karate is more traditional than kickboxing. Anbo Jutsu, a made-up Star Trek martial art, is clearly more traditional than, I don't know, Tsunkatsu, which is another made-up Star Trek martial art, 
that looks like pit fighting and that Dwayne The Rock Johnson apparently practices. These both exist. I did not make them up. Star Trek is a weird show, and I absolutely love it. Moreover, most people tend to agree about which arts are traditional and which ones are modern, with only a few real edge cases that people like to argue about. So there's definitely a cultural concept somewhere in there. Like Mr. Dan said, there may not be a clear definition, but there is a boundary between the two, albeit a fuzzy one, with a lot of overlap. And I think that I've actually found a good definition for it. In one of my very old videos, probably one of the first, if not the first, to come out on this channel, I laid out my personal Goju-Ryu lineage. Obviously, I'm not super proud of that video, which is why I'm not going to link it in a card right about now, but hey, it was a first attempt, of course I'm going to look back on it and not like it compared to my latest stuff. However, in that video, I do feel like I placed way too big an importance on lineage. If you want to claim to be a representative of a certain style, then you should probably be able to prove that the person who taught you knew what they were doing, and lineage is one of the simplest ways out there to prove that. If you only trained with someone for like a year at most and it was really on and off, then could you really say that you were even their student, let alone their successor? But at the same time, lineage doesn't win fights. Even someone who was the best martial artist and the best teacher ever could just have a student who doesn't really get it. And if you study under that guy, it doesn't really matter how good his teacher was because he still won't be a good instructor for you. A good instructor can occasionally produce bad students, but a bad teacher almost never produces a talented student. I bring this point up because both Ramsey Dewey and Mr. Dan point out that traditional martial arts often rely on a lineage, either a direct lineage of instruction or one of passing down the ideals and the general form of an art as the founder intended. This kind of definition is a little better than other ones, and many martial arts do simply seek to reproduce the training methods of the style's originators, which partially explains certain karateka's obsession with the makiwara and other older hojo undo equipment, even when focus pads, punching bags, and weights are generally much better at doing the things that hojo undo tools were invented for. But I still think that they're missing a little something with that definition, and actually, karate is a great example as to why. A lot of the second or third generation successors of various karate styles absolutely added new material all the time. Some of them authored whole new katas to add to their styles, and many others cross-trained in various arts and either added them to their karate or at the very least to their repertoire of fighting skills. Mabuni Kenwa and Miyagi Chojun both experimented with various protectors, such as baseball catcher's gear, in order to create bogu kumite, a type of sparring that could theoretically let karateka practice with much more power and aliveness without risking serious injury. Besides, there are plenty of things that traditional martial arts love to do that directly contradict what their style's founders either said or did. Miyagi Chojun sensei specifically said, we should open karate to the public and receive criticism, opinions, and studies from other prominent fighting artists. So any Goju Ryu Dojo that looks down on you for cross-training or for pressure testing your style isn't being very traditional, at least by the definition of trying to carry on a lineage. In fact, most styles of karate have something similar in their history, either as something their founder said or something they did, since most originators of styles studied under more than one teacher and tested their mettle against other fighters in various ways. I think that a better way to think about it is that Traditional martial arts often like to justify the way they do things by appealing to a constructed story about the past. Even if the practice or technique that they're justifying is a relatively recent invention, such as wearing the gi or not doing full contact sparring, or saying us, their explanations for these features of their practice generally avoid talking about whether they're useful or not, and instead focus on an imagined history that these things represent a continuity with. I mean, plenty of arts have a uniform, let's be honest. Muay Thai has a uniform, BJJ has a uniform, boxing and wrestling both have uniforms, and those uniforms have changed over time, just like the gi has changed over time for karateka or judoka. Traditional language is also sometimes thought to be a hallmark of a traditional martial arts style, like how karateka will call front kicks maingeri. 
But those terms are new too, which is why you'll sometimes hear mawashiyuke being referred to as either toraguchi or morote shoteate. The terms were invented pretty recently, and because of that, different people came up with different terms for the same thing. For an example of this in, let's say, boxing, because why not, look at the term undercut, which is just an outdated term for what now gets called an uppercut. While it is tempting to assume that just because traditional martial arts say that they're carrying on the traditions of the past, they actually are, it's not like they're somehow immune to updating and changing their styles, techniques, and training methods. The way they update things might look different than, say, the way a boxer learns how to deal with new techniques, but I'd be willing to bet that the majority of traditional martial arts today would be almost unrecognizable to someone who had practiced them 50 or 100 years ago. The truth is, it's just really hard to maintain a tradition. Back to the topic of lineage, though, I think that the best argument against using a connection to an historical founder as the pure definition of traditional martial arts comes in the form of most Chinese martial arts. While a large number of them do have people who they claim to be their founders, like Fang Qinyang of White Crane, many of those stories are just myths, and it's debatable whether those people actually existed in real life. And even if they did exist, it's very clear that almost no one trains the way that those founders used to anymore. Forget carrying on the intents of the style's founder, most people don't even know how to carry on the intent of their own teacher. All right, so I've talked a lot about what traditional martial arts doesn't mean. So let's start making our way towards an actual answer about what it does mean. There are a lot of features that traditional martial arts generally share. While sometimes it's simply geographical origin, and we do seem a lot more likely to call East Asian arts traditional than similar arts that come from the West, there is one big thing that every traditional martial art has in common. Rituals. Rituals can be actions, like saying the dojo kun before every class or bowing to your teacher, but they can also be things like patterns of dress or the use of common terminology and language, like wearing a gi and counting ich, ni, san. For traditional martial arts, the rituals are as important as the technical aspect of training in why people actually practice them. This is the key argument in John Donahue's article, The Ritual Dimension of Karate Do. When I first started writing this video, that was the definition that I was going to end with. Traditional martial arts are all about ritual, even when that ritual seems completely disconnected from what they actually say they're trying to do. But the more that I thought about it, the more that definition just wasn't sitting right with me. Because while modern martial arts usually have fewer traditions, they definitely do still have them, and many of them even hold their traditions in much higher regard than some traditional martial arts do. Muay Thai is the obvious and best example, since more traditionally-minded Nakmui have rituals that rival even the most weeby karate dojo, but honorable mention also goes to the glove touch that boxers and MMAs almost always do right after the bell rings. Anytime people do the same kind of activity over and over again, rituals are going to start to form. But don't worry, I think I figured it out. It's not just that traditional martial arts have more rituals than modern ones, especially since a lot of the so-called traditional martial artists love to throw those rituals out of the window. To me, what really sets traditional martial arts apart from modern ones isn't just that they have rituals, it's why they have rituals. Or rather, what they say their reasons for them are. Because a lot of modern martial arts have rituals for showing respect to fellow fighters or trainees, or because they think that they're just a fun part of the gym's culture. But traditional arts almost always justify their rituals by saying, that's just how it used to be done. To be clear, whether or not that's actually true isn't what matters. Okinawans weren't running around saying us to each other, yet a lot of traditional dojos say it so much that it's almost hard to believe that they are capable of saying anything else. What matters to traditional martial arts is less the real history, but rather the stories that they tell about it. That is to say, the historiography. Historiography is a rather tricky notion to try and condense, but the Cliff's Notes version of it is that it's the story that we tell using historical facts. How you interpret the data, which sources you read or choose to believe, and even the order that you present facts in, 
All of that is historiography. An example that many of my karateka in the audience should be familiar with is the story of Bodhidharma, or Daruma as the Japanese call him. According to legendary tradition, Bodhidharma was the Gyana or Zen monk who first transmitted Zen practice to China from India. Whether or not he actually existed as a real person is a matter of some debate, although influential Japanese lay monk Daisetsu Suzuki argued that he was a real person. Of the many fantastical stories about his life, the most interesting one to me is the one that claims that he found the monks of the Shaolin Temple, to which he had traveled, to be in very poor physical health, and that he developed a set of 18 exercises for them. The legend goes that those exercises would eventually become Luo Han Chuen, the monk fist style of Chinese martial arts. So anyone want to take a guess as to how likely it is that that story is true? And okay, even if there was a single person who was the originator of Shaolin boxing, which is debatable, how likely is it that there's an unbroken line of succession that connects him thousands of years ago to our karate today? The majority of so-called Shaolin styles of Chinese martial arts already have trouble tracing an origin back to the real Shaolin temple, whatever one they claim that is, and even among those karateka who studied with Chinese teachers, the chances that the people that they studied with were among that small group of styles is even smaller, let alone the fact that a lot of us don't practice the way that they did. And yet, everyone from Miyagi Chojun Sensei to Funakoshi Gichin Sensei gives some credit to Bodhidharma for kicking off their style. I think that this trend of justifying your rituals by a tenuous connection to a likely imaginary past is also responsible for explaining why traditional martial arts are so much more likely to ignore newer and more effective techniques in favor of outdated or just simply untrue methods. Roka Slio over at Martial Arts Journey has made a good point that traditional martial arts don't always equate to fantasy-based martial arts, but there is a definite trend of traditional martial arts having relatively low standards, so to speak. In modern styles, if new information or a better training method is presented to them, they generally have an easier time adapting to it, but traditional martial arts often feel like they have to find an excuse to adopt it by trying to read back or rewrite their style's history. Even if they do eventually adopt these techniques, like many karate dojos with focus pads, it's significantly later than it needs to be. I mean, some people would prefer to go out and buy a broom handle and pour concrete around it to make a chiishi, rather than go out and buy some normal weights and train with those. Of course, how traditional a martial art is really exists on a sliding scale, and even within the same art, certain practitioners or gyms will do things more out of this mindset than others. Rituals can exist for many other reasons. For instance, the glove touch is generally a way of showing respect to an opponent and acknowledging that the fighters aren't personally enemies, just competitors in the ring. And some of the most modern martial arts will occasionally develop rituals because that's how it used to be done. Like how some BJJ practitioners believe that you should bring your coach a pineapple on your first day. Which I wholeheartedly support. That's a great tradition. And these traditions don't even have to refer to some far-off and ancient past. Krav Maga, especially outside of Israel, is a very mixed bag, but a lot of Krav schools will have their students practice in clothes or fatigues that are at least reminiscent of the art's origins in the Israeli Defense Forces, for example. There are no doubt many reasons why people form traditions, but one of the most important is that the practice of certain traditions helps to maintain an emotive continuity with the past. Tradition lets you reach out and touch elements of the past that are otherwise unreachable, lost in the sands of time, or lost like tears in rain. I haven't actually watched Blade Runner, um, but I know that line because it's famous. But by and large, which traditions we choose to follow and what we think the important traditions are depends on what we ourselves believe in the present. So how do you actually practice traditional karate? I've said before on this channel that I do kind of consider myself a traditionalist with my practice of karate, but my traditional looks a lot different than the traditional of other karateka. By my definition, actually, the way that I practice has very little in common with traditional karate, since I've eliminated a lot of rituals from my personal practice, and I'll do it again, 
And while I will follow the etiquette at dojos that I visit, I have no desire to continue those rituals on my own, or in the future when hopefully I'm the one doing the teaching. But that being said, there are some traditions, as it were, that I do try to follow. I mentioned that while rituals can be physical actions, like bowing or saying certain words, they can also be psychological. Rather than attempting to emulate the exact actions of people from the past, whether they be your art's founder or some important figure in its development, we can always try and instead carry on the legacy of what they thought. And while it can be difficult to know for certain exactly how things were done in the past, unless it's so recent as to have video evidence, the writings and the history of karate's pioneers do still exist, and they can tell us what their intent was. So the specific karate traditions that I try to follow are the traditions of seeking out new information and updating my practice accordingly. That's right, the constant updating and pressure testing of one style counts as a tradition to me. <laughs> Miyagi Chojun Sensei is a great example of this, regularly traveling and studying with different styles and encouraging his students to cross-train in other arts. Personally, I think that if you want to make your karate an effective art for real fighting, that intellectual tradition is much, much more important than any number of Japanese words or special uniforms that you could wear. Thanks to anyone who stuck around to hear me out on what a traditional martial art really is. If you found it helpful, feel free to like the video, as if you need my permission to do that. <laughs> and if you disagree, please argue in the comments to drive my engagement, because that's the kind of thing that YouTube likes to see, and I won't lie, I do like to see my videos do well in the algorithm. If you would like to see those videos do well in the algorithm, then, as you probably know, you should subscribe to this channel, and turn on notifications if you'd like to watch them as soon as they're released. Doing those things tells YouTube that they should show my videos to more people, which is why I ask you to do that, and it's also why almost every other YouTuber asks you those exact same things. And, in fact, it's why I base my outro spiel directly on the way that some of my favorite YouTubers do it. So I guess you could say it's become sort of a... YouTube tradition. I've been the Goju Yu philosopher, and go break some boards or whatever. If anybody cancels me for saying us too much in this video, fair.